The early days of the Animal Kingdom's tenure on planet Earth were so amassed with oddballs and weirdos that I sometimes feel like I was born in the wrong generation. This was a time when animals were beginning to truly tighten their grip on the globe, and the ocean's ecosystems were starting to approach the level of complexity that they have today. Among the harbingers of this newfound ecological complexity were a group of animals called the Radiodonts. These strange creatures, closely related to arthropods like insects and arachnids but not quite arthropods themselves, first arose in the Cambrian period, and were some of the biggest animals of their time. They were immensely diverse in physical appearance, which in turn is indicative of a corresponding diversity in lifestyle, though there are nevertheless a few unifying traits present in all members of the group. Radiodonts universally show clear adaptations for swimming, all being completely legless animals, instead possessing rows of lateral flaps along their body, with which they would have propelled themselves through the water via wave-like undulations. Almost all possessed a circular mouth apparatus called an oral cone, from which the group's name radiodont, meaning radial tooth, is derived. They also had stalked, compound eyes, and a pair of frontal appendages that were likely used to seize and manipulate prey. While the radiodonts were best known for being some of the first large apex predators, it seems that they pioneered another major ecological niche as well. The Cambrian saw an unprecedented surge in biodiversity, often dubbed the Cambrian Explosion. But evolution wasn't finished there. Well, no shit, otherwise we wouldn't be here. The following period, the Ordovician, saw its own major diversification event, called the Ordovician Radiation. While the Cambrian saw the advent of most major animal groups alive today, including the arthropods, echinoderms, mollusks, and chordates, the Ordovician period saw a subsequent consolidation of these existing phyla their diversity bolstered by immense evolutionary radiation within each group. But how did the radiodonts fare in this ever-changing world? Most, unfortunately, had gone extinct by the end of the Cambrian. However, one family within this group, the Herdiidae, managed to persist. And among them was a truly awe-inspiring species that turned a new page in our knowledge of these ancient predators. In Morocco's Fizuata Shale, a geological formation dating to the early Ordovician that contains extraordinarily detailed fossils of an all manner of organisms, I am not making that mistake again, the remains of a radiodont were discovered. But not just any radiodont. This was a giant. Measuring around two meters long, it completely dwarfed any other radiodont known thus far. Indeed, at its time, it was perhaps the largest animal the world had ever seen. It was named Agirocassus ben Maoli. The genus name Agirocassus is derived from the Norse god of the sea, Agia, and Cassus, Latin for helmet, referring to the enormous plate of armour covering the upper surface of the animal's head. The species name ben Maoli honours Mohammed ben Maula, who discovered the Fizuata shale in which the species' remains were unearthed. The sheer size of Agirocassus alone is enough to warrant it some recognition. But just in case that wasn't enough to impress the bipedal apes that would eventually uncover its remains over 400 million years into the future, it possessed other features of worthy note. One was the unique morphology of its frontal appendages. As aforementioned, these, a trait ubiquitous across all radiodonts, were almost certainly used for feeding purposes and thus provide clues about the diet and hunting habits of the animal that wielded them. And the frontal appendages of Agirocassus, which were adorned with long, trailing feather-like structures, suggested that it pioneered a lifestyle that today is common among marine megafauna. Filter feeding. In our modern oceans, filter feeders include some of the largest animals alive, such as baleen whales like Balaenoptera musculus, the most massive animal known to have ever existed. 
as well as the two biggest living shark species, Rhinocodon typus and Cetorhinus maximus. Further examples of filter feeding leviathans are peppered throughout prehistory, including the giant Jurassic pachycormid fish Leedsichthys and the Devonian placoderm Titanichthys. I could go on forever listing binomial names of assorted giant filter feeders, but I'm sure there's other ways to flex on my viewers that don't make it blindingly obvious that I need to get a fucking life, so I'll stop right here. The bottom line is, the ecological niche of being a huge swimming filter feeder has been a recurring phenomenon for much of the animal kingdom's history, and Agiro Cassis is regarded as the earliest known example of this. Which in turn means that the radiodonts were pioneers in more ways than previously thought, being not only some of the first big apex predators, but the first filter feeding giants as well. So Agiro Cassis was both a behemoth and a pioneer of its time. But even that is not all, for it was also something of a game changer in terms of how we perceive radiodonts as a whole. And at the root of all that was the unique manner in which some of its fossils were preserved. Most fossils of early Paleozoic animals are entirely two-dimensional, but that wasn't the case here. For some specimens of Agirocassis were found in which the animal was preserved in three dimensions, and that made evident a feature that had never before been noticed in a radiodont. In contrast to familiar forms like Anomalocaris, which possessed a single row of lateral flaps on each side of the body, Agirocassis fossils showed clear evidence of two sets of flaps, one dorsally positioned and the other ventrally positioned. This in turn prompted scientists to re-examine fossils of other radiodont species that were previously assumed to have possessed only a single set of flaps. And in some cases, evidence was found that they too had two pairs of flaps per segment instead of one. An example of this was Peitoia, a comparatively small, stocky herdiod radiodont from the Cambrian that upon closer examination showed clear evidence of both dorsal and ventral flaps. And dual rows of flaps on radiodonts are more than just an interesting thing to know about. Their presence provides key insight regarding the evolutionary origin of arthropod limbs. As I mentioned toward the beginning of this video, radiodonts were not true arthropods but were nevertheless more closely related to them than to any other animal group alive today. Arthropods, unlike the radiodonts, possess armoured, jointed limbs that can broadly be divided into two categories, biramus and uniramus. Biramus limbs, as present in crustaceans such as this Eustachus sulcatus, are split into two separate branches toward the tip the endopod on the inner side of the leg, and the exopod on the outer. Uniramus limbs, such as those possessed by centipedes, are unbranched. Of these two forms, biramus limbs seem to represent the original ancestral state for arthropods. Given their apparent phylogenetic placement immediately basal to arthropods, one would expect that radiodonts would have showed some signs of early development of biramus appendages, especially since the gilled lobopodians, which occupied an even more basal position, did seem to possess exactly that, with each body segment bearing a pair of flaps toward the top and a pair of limbs at the bottom. This, however, had been curiously absent in radiodonts, with each segment seemingly bearing just a single pair of flaps and no ventral appendages. But with the discovery of Agirocassis and the subsequent realisation that it, along with a few other radiodonts, had both dorsal and ventral flaps, this inconsistency has been resolved. The evolutionary origin of the exopod on a biramus limb is still subject to debate, but it seems more generally accepted that the endopod, at least, is homologous with both the ventral limbs of gilled lobopodians and the ventral flaps of radiodonts. Homologous features, if you aren't aware, 
are features shared by organisms that are inherited via common ancestry, as opposed to having evolved independently in separate lineages. But how, you might ask, can one bridge the rather expansive gap between two separate flaps and a single limb with a forked tip? Well, luckily enough, there is clear fossil evidence of creatures that display a near-perfect midpoint in this transition. Take, for example, Eratus sperare. This primitive arthropod possessed rows of flaps alike to those of radiodonts, but arising from the bases of the lateral flaps were segmented limbs. Creatures like this are regarded as transitional forms, bridging the gap between radiodonts and more modern arthropods. But alas, there is yet much to be learned, and clear-cut conclusions about the origin of arthropod limbs remain tantalisingly just out of reach. Agirocassus truly was a gift that kept on giving for paleontology, a leviathan of its time that also represented the earliest known example of a giant filter feeder, shed new light on the anatomy of radiodonts as a whole, and helped resolve an inconsistency in our understanding of the evolutionary relationship between radiodonts and arthropods. If you'd like to see another strange radiodont, feel free to check out this old video about Titanochorus. And if the Lobopodians that I mentioned earlier interested you, then this video about the giant Omnidens Amplus should be exactly what you're looking for. And of course, if you enjoyed my content, then feel free to subscribe. That's it from me right now, and I shall hopefully see you again very soon.